I want to talk about uh, timidity today. Timidity. Uh, a person who is easily intimidated is a, tim a, a timid person. Timidity is just another way of saying uh, afraid, fearful. And I'm talking about getting out of the fearful, intimidated, uh, afraid rut this morning. It comes in all different kinds and sizes. Some people say, well, I'm, I'm afraid to share my faith. I don't know, I want to, but man, when I'm at the water cooler at work, I just can't speak up. It's like, it's inside, I want to get it out, but I'm just kind of intimidated by the this, this situation, the surroundings. Some it's just simply public prayer. Yeah, we pray for our meals at home, but when I'm in the restaurant, come on, to bow my head and pray, what would that make everybody around me feel like? And they're intimidated, and they got, they got a spirit of fear just about praying. Some is public speaking. I could never get up in front of a crowd and speak. Now, some people have a fear of uh, singing, solo. And some people say, yeah, I sing solo, so low you can't hear me. <laughs> they have this fear of singing that I don't want to sing too loud because I might be off key. And I was reminded the other day, the Bible only says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. But we get a little intimidated, fearful about singing. We get, uh, some people are uh, intimidated and a little fearful about being baptized. I had... Uh, a, a lady in my uh, first church, she was uh, afraid of putting her head under water. Okay? She had this fear of water. And she was a Christian. I, I had opportunity to lead the family to Christ, and she wanted to be baptized, but she said, can you do it some other way? I don't want to go underwater. I said, oh, well, you've you got a fear here. You need to face your fear. And she said, well, part of it is I don't want you putting on me on my back and pushing me under. I said, well, we can still get you under without pushing you down under on your back. And so we did. She went in. I filled the baptistry extra high. And she squatted down until she was covered. <laughs> she came right back up. You see, we, we, facing our fears. Everybody seems to have, have a fear. Um, I mentioned, I, I just mentioned that we're going to have a, a giving campaign on that it's for our budget. Our proposed budget has been pulled together. It's higher than it was last year, but God has blessed us. We more than exceeded our budget last year, but we're stretching ourselves for next year, and we need our congregation to be able to say, you know what, I will step out in faith and give more than I did last year, but some people say, you know, I, I'm afraid to tithe. I'm already telling you, God gave you already more than enough. Think about this for a moment. If God has give, is asking you to give 10%, he's not asking you to give something he hasn't already given you. So he's already given you the 10%. And so you already have more than enough. So if you give it to him, you don't believe for one moment that God isn't going to bless that other 90% so it accomplishes everything you think you need 100% for. He's already given you more than enough. But there's something fearful about that. Well, if I give that, how am I going to pay my water bill? How am I going to do my rent? How am I going to do my house payment? How am I going to make my car payment? Oh, how am I going to take care of my insurance? How am I? And it goes on and on. How am I going to cover the cost of rising gas? How am I going to? And we just, okay, we got that, that whole scenario. There's a fear. Other people have other kinds of fears. Uh, anybody have a fear of bugs? <laughs> fear of bugs. Believe it or not, that was my dad's fear. My dad, I, I looked at him as a solid stalwart. He was afraid of spiders. Anybody afraid of spiders? And I have a brother that's afraid of snakes. Anybody afraid of snakes? Ooh. <laughs> All right. We have these fears. Anybody afraid of heights? Oh, yeah, we got the fear of heights. I got give to give credit to my wife. My, my wife had a fear of flying. Flying. Especially on a propeller airplane. So we didn't tell her. We're going on a missionary trip, and we'd schedule a propeller airplane to get us from Flint to Chicago. 
and she's standing in front of the big window as the plane's not here yet. And she's standing, talking to the youth, how, you know, she's afraid of flying, but she'll fly. We didn't tell her it was a propeller plane. And uh, while she's telling all the kids that, you know, that you don't have to be afraid because, you know, she's overcome her fear, the propeller plane comes in. And they're all looking at this big plane coming in with these big propellers. And poor Diane turned around and went, <laughs> propeller plane. She got fear, had a fear of flying. She said, I need to face my fear. Jim had a pilot's license, and we went up on a single prop, little tiny plane, and we flew to Marshall. She had a fear of flying, and she said, but I really do want to go to Italy. Well, you can't, you know how long it takes to go by boat? <laughs> Nobody's driving there. Nobody's driving there. And so uh, she said, you know, with a little Valium, I think I can make it. <laughs> a little fear. You see, a little fear. But not only did we make it to Italy, she faced her fear a second time, and we went to Germany, all right? You see? Fear. We all have fears. We all have fears. I, I jotted down some because there's so many of them. Uh, uh, talk, uh, I already talked about fear of water, fear of spiders, fear of flying, uh, fear of doctors. Anybody got a little fear of the needle when you go to the dentist? Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure. I can keep going on. Fears, 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 fears. I want to talk about getting out of being intimidated by the fear. Circumstance or person could be a bully. I want, I want to talk about getting out of that rut from the passage that we're in today. The time of the timid, the timidity, or the intimation, the intimidation, it says after Ehud had died, there's a time. And that's when it took place. It says that the Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. We've been looking at this book and we've been watching the cycle. They keep going through the same cycle over and over and over again. Around and around she goes. They did evil. They were evil times. I haven't really dwelt on how evil the times are. We will on the last message of the series. Because at the end of the book, he gives three scenarios to just to show you how evil it was in these times. And in every scenario, he says this, there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You know what it was? It was a mob. It was utter chaos. There wasn't a highly structured government. There was no king who was calling the shots. There was no standing army. There was no police enforcing it, okay? Okay. There were 12 tribes, but every man thought, I'm going to do it my way. Well, you know when you get a group of people together, come on, just get a group of Republicans and Democrats in the same room. <laughs> you know what it's like. A mob conflict is erupting. Why? Every man wants to do it his way without having an order and a structure to handle that. And so in the society, it was rampant with evil. And we're going to see it was really terrible evil. It was like being in modern America. That's how bad it was. They were evil times, and, and it clicked it twice. And so the Lord be, the says there, every man, they did evil in their own eyes, the Lord's eyes, and the Lord disciplined his people and sold them into slavery. These foreign powers were invading their land and oppressing them, pushing them down. Very oppressive, because that's what it says. Sisera who was the commander of the army of the Amorites, he came with his 900 iron chariots and cruelly oppressed the Israelites. And God said, hey, you don't want to serve me? You want to serve false gods? You want to put yourself first? You want to put your economy first? You want to put whatever it is you're putting first? He said, you want to put that all first? Go for it. I'll just stand back and see what happens. Oh, other people are doing the same things you're doing are more powerful and they're coming and dominating you. He's just letting them go the full course of their own way. Of their own way. The times of the timid are listed here. You know, they're crying times. Finally, it is so bad that they cry out to the Lord. I find it very interesting that they use the word cry. It's not that they pray, it's not that they ask, it's not that they petition, but they cry because they're in pain, they're in agony, they've been abused and misused, and it's all of their own doing. 
and they cry to the Lord, help, save us. And the Lord responds with the call to the timid. Call to the timid. Deborah. Now, you would expect at this point that he would raise up a, a big, strong warrior, but it's a woman that God introduces into the pa passage. They cry for help, and God has a woman. Now, before there was ever a women's lib movement here in America, there was one back in the nation of Israel. Because <laughs> you watch what this woman is. Deborah, you know what her name means? Her name means bee. You know, like a little insect that flies with wings and has a stinger on the end. A little bee. I call her the queen bee. <laughs> this gal was a queen bee. Because watch what it says. She is a prophetess. Now, a prophet, as we saw before, I've mentioned this several times, a prophet is someone who receives a direct message from God. God was speaking to Deborah. Whoa. She had a real connection with God. God was speaking to her, and he, she, was, she was simply God's mouthpiece. She spoke the word of the Lord. She's a prophetess. She is equal to any prophet. You see the equality in the Bible? <laughs> she is a prophetess. Not only that, she's a spouse. She's married. She's got a husband. Lapidoth. And, and Lapidoth, you know, uh, he's the guy who's known as, hey, oh, yeah, he's the husband of Deborah. <laughs> you know? Uh, people often say, oh, yeah, that's, the pastor's wife, right? When I went and my wife was working in a, the doctor's office, they say, oh yeah, that's Diane's husband. I finally got a little feel for what that's like. Hey, Lapidus, he's the guy that, he's not famous, nobody knows him, nobody comes to see him. They all come to see his wife. She's outshining him, and, and apparently she's got a good marriage because God is working in, in through her. And so the greater is the woman, and the lesser is the man. That's a little bit against our culture today, isn't it? Whoa. You know, when it came to legal matters, I bet he even submitted to his wife. Isn't that what the Bible says? Submit one to another? I had to submit to a woman not too long ago. I'm driving down the road. Lights go on, shh, shh, hits the siren one time. Oh, must mean me. I pull over, sure enough, pulls over. Officer comes over and I look up. She's got purple eyes. Purple eyes. Now, who's born with purple eyes? And I said, wow, you got purple eyes. <laughs> Through those color contacts. So I'm talking to her and it's a woman officer. You know what she She demanded of me to give her my driver's license. Oh, man, I give it out. I'm submitting to this woman. I'm doing exactly what the woman's telling me to do. You see, submission, is, this, this is so messed up in our culture, all right? Lapidoth, even though he's the husband and she submits to her husband as a godly woman, he submits to her in whatever areas it's, she's important in. And that's the way it works, okay? It's the way it works. It's, it's the biblical way it works. She's a wife. And notice this. She is a leader. She was leading Israel. Listen, they had no king. They had no governor. So they called the person a leader. She was a leader. She's a God-ordained leader. And she's a prophetess. She's a wife. She's the queen bee. I told you that. That's her name. She's queen bee. She's queen bee. Notice this. She also held court. She is a judge. She's judging men. She's judging boys. She's judging women. She's judging girls. She's judging people. She's judging uh, court cases uh, of crime. She's judging uh, business cases. She's domestic. She's, she's the judge. She's a judge in Israel. She was judging under the palm of Deborah. I'm assuming they called that. That's where she held court. And they named it that place because she was the judge that was holding court there. And Israelites all came to her to have their disputes decided. Everyone knew who she was. This is a pretty powerful passage. Now, she calls, she sends for Barak. Now, Barak must have been uh, another leader in the community. 
And she says to him, Brock, the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, go. She's giving him an order from the Lord. You see, God speaks to Deborah directly, and Deborah's the mouthpiece, and, and she tells Barak, you're to go. It's kind of like the preacher. The preacher brings the message of the word of the Lord to you, and, and the, the, the commandment is to go and make disciples of all nations, and, and I pass that on to you. She's passing on the Lord's message. She says, go and take 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead the way to Mount Tabor. Well, the 10,000 men, 10, men haven't gathered yet, but she's a prophetess, so she knows what's going to happen in the future. She's already specifying the amount that's going to arrive. Isn't that great? She's a prophetess. And she says, this is what the Lord says. The Lord says, I will lure that commander Sisera of the Amorites. I'm going to, invent, I'm going to bring him out with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River, and I'm going to hand him, I'm going to give him into your hands. She is doing what we call predictive prophecy. She is telling what is going to happen in the future. You go there, and the Lord is for some reason going to draw them to you. That is the appointed place where the battle is going to take place. Wow. Man, this is Barak. Wow. God called Barak. Isn't that amazing? He said, God, out of all the people in Israel, called Barak. Deborah believed in him. Okay, she's passing the message on. Yeah, she doesn't say, Lord, uh, do you know who this Barak guy is? Remember when Saul was being introduced to the, the church at, in his conversion experience? And they said, uh, wait a minute, uh, Lord, we know what this guy's like. You sure you want him for the leader? Not so with Deborah believes in him. Listen, not only to that, but when they make the call to everybody come, 10,000 men show up to go into battle under his leadership. Man, what a privileged person he is. But Barak said to her, uh, only if you go with me, I will go. Uh, but, but if you don't go with me, I won't go. You know what the problem here is? You know why he's doing this? You know what the problem is? He's timid. He's timid. He's got a little timidity. It's like when the Lord prompts you at the water cooler to share your faith. And you don't want to speak up the name of Jesus. Or you're hanging with your friends watching a game. Or you're whatever it is. You're shopping with the ladies, a good friend. And something comes up and it's a perfect door of opportunity. And you know you should, you know you can, but you just don't want to. You're timid. Timidity. It's at that moment that you really feel like you're powerless. Like, uh, I don't know what exact words to say. Uh, they're going to ask me a question that I don't have the answer to. Boy, that's going to really make me look bad and embarrass me. Or uh, take our special offering, this uh, uh, faith promise that we're doing. Oh, man, I don't know. If I could really give the Lord 10%, I know theoretically that he's supposed to bless me, but I think I'm going to need to hang on to, to that money so that I can make my car payment. You know, my car is in trouble, and what if I have a breakdown? And I just don't feel like I can do that. I'm powerless. I'm stuck in my tracks. The, the second one was self-centeredness. It always focuses on me. And Brock is there, and I just got to think that in his mind, he's saying, who am I to lead all these people? Why me? Why didn't you pick somebody else? I really don't think I can do this. There's a lot of I in there rather than, yes, Lord, whatever you want in my life, I'll do it. I'll be a fully follower, devoted, a de devoted follower of Jesus. The third thing that may have entered in is what I call an unsound mind. And the unsound mind is what, you can just write this down, it's the hypothetical thinking. What if, what if there got more people than we got? I'm committing to go into battle. I don't even know, I don't even know how many men are on the other side. Uh, what if they ask me the question that I can't answer? What if a problem comes up so I can't meet my faith promise? What if, and there's what if, 
what if the doctor tells me it's cancer? What if? And all these what ifs, your mind goes crazy, whirling, swirling of what could happen, and he's got to be worried in that vein too because he's just like us. He's just like us. Very well, Deborah says. I will go, but because the way you're going about this, you're being intimidated, the honor will not be yours. For the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. I want to tell you right now, there is no honor in fear. I don't care if it's just being afraid of the dark. I don't, I don't care if it's afraid of flying. I don't care if it's uh, being afraid uh, of being in an MRI, claustrophobic. There's no honor in that. Because when you are afraid, you don't do what you should do. You don't do it. I don't get the MRI so that they can't scan my brain to find out I got a tumor there and how to treat it. And I just let it go. I don't commit to a faith promise because if I do, uh, what, what happens if I'm shortchanged? And, and it prevents me of, of seeing God work in my life to use the 90% instead of the 10%. I'm afraid of water, so I don't want to be baptized because I don't want to be baptized. And I, I don't take that step of obedience to the Lord for Him to bless me. Fear. There is no honor in fear. There is no honor in fear. So Deborah went with Barak down to Kadesh where he summoned Zebulun and Naphtali. And, oh, just as she had predicted, 10,000 men followed him. And Deborah also went with him. Oh, 10,001, because Deborah's with him too. You see, yeah, they say behind every great man there's a woman. Well, here, here she is. She's propping up Barak because Barak just can't do it on his own. Can't do it on his own. Now, the enemy of the timid is always imposing. When they told Sisera of Barak, and, uh, the son of uh, uh, Benaom, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera gathered together 900 iron chariots. Here's the Israelites. They got, you know, they're, they're, a lot of them are just farmers and, you know, craftsmen. And, and they, they got their pitchforks. They got their shovels and... Most of them have a sword, and they have bows and arrows and things like, you know, they hunted and did those things. But they're a ragtag army. They're like uh, American patriots going up against the British Empire. And so they're going up against a professional army, and they're a bunch of ragtag. You've got 10,000 of them, but they have iron chariots. That's like going against uh, your enemy, and, and you basically got pea shooters, and they got army tanks. And that's pretty intimidating. Be a little afraid. That's the enemy. The enemy always intimidates you. Always. If they didn't, they wouldn't be an enemy. You'd have already conquered them. They always intimidate. You're always up against something. So Deborah says to Barak, go, this is the day. Don't you like that? I like that. We got a song. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Yeah. Let us rejoice. And what? Be glad in it. Here she said, this is the day the Lord has given him into your hands. You're the victor. You're already the victor. That's like the preacher getting up and saying, hey, you've already got the victory in Jesus. You just got to claim it. That's what's going on here. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? Of course he has. For us, hasn't the Lord already paid for all of our sins on the cross? Don't we already have the victory? Yes, we do. It's just great. So Barak went down to Mount Tabor, followed by 10,000 men. And Barak advanced, and the Lord routed Sisera, just as Deborah predicted. All his chariots and armies, by the sword, they destroyed everyone. And Sisera, here's the triumph, here's the triumph. Sisera abandons his chariot. He fled on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as uh, Harosheth, uh, Hagoyim, and all the troops of Sisera fell by the sword. 
Not a man was left. Total annihilation, total victory, total conquest, total victory. I, I mean, this was awesome. But she had predicted the honor will not be yours. You were timid. You caved to your fear. In spite of you, God gave the victory, but you caved. You gave in. You see, Sisera, however, fled on foot. He wasn't with all the army. He took off in another direction. And while Barak chased the whole army and did the annihilation, whoa, he fled to Jael. Now, Jael's a, a woman. He's, she's the wife of Heber the Kenite. And because there was friendly relations between Jabin the king of Hazor and the clan of Heber of the Kenites, because they got this, this uh, relationship going on, Jael went out and beat him and said to Sisera, Come, my Lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. He's the only one left of his whole army. And she entered, so he enters into the tent, and she put a covering over him and said, I'm thirsty, he said. Hey, he's been fighting all day, and he's been running like crazy, trying to get away from everybody. He says, I'm thirsty. Please give me some water. And she opens up. She doesn't give him water, man. She gets out a skin of milk and gives him a drink. She's fattening him up for the kill. She covers him up. She's taking good care of him. Stand by the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone here, say no. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through the temple into the ground and he died. This is an X-rated book. <laughs> For violence. She finished him off. Barak comes. He's late because he'd been pursuing the whole army and having great victory. But he didn't get the commander, so now he's, I'm going to get that guy. I'm, I'm going to get that guy. And so he arrives in pursuit of Sisera, and Jael went out to meet him and said, Oh, come, she said. I'll show you the man you're looking for. And so she went in with her. He went in with her. And there lay Sisera with the tent peg through the temple, dead. What am I saying? The next chapter, Deborah sings a song. It's a song of Deborah. And in the song of Deborah, she is singing about the champion, the war, the victory, how God intervened and blessed. And it's not about Barak. He was intimidated. He was afraid. He was full of fear. He couldn't do it. Most blessed of women be jail. Most blessed of tent-dwelling women. He asked for water. She gave him milk. In a bowl fit for nobles, she brought him curdled milk. Her hand reached for the tent peg. Her right hand for the workman's hammer. She struck Sisera. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. At her feet he sank, he fell. There he lay. At her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell dead just as she had predicted. The honor will not be yours, Barak. The Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. What I'm trying to say here is this. When you are afraid, scared, timid, intimidated, whatever term you're going to use, you lose. You lose. If you're intimidated by flying, you'll never get to Europe. <laughs> if you're intimidated by water, you'll never be baptized. You see what I'm saying? If you're intimidated by the, the economy, you'll never be able to part with what you have and give to be blessed by God. It's just the way it works. Whenever you are afraid, if you're afraid of the dark, you won't go into the theater. <laughs> they do turn off the lights when they show the movie. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Whatever it is that you're afraid of, you lose. It's just the way it works. You lose. So how do I get unstuck? How do I get out of this intimidation, timid, fearful rut? How do I do that? You have to be courageous. You just have to be courageous. You've got to dig deep down inside and be courageous. In 2 Timothy 1.7, it's all summed up in a little succinct verse. 
God has not given us Christians a spirit of fear. Now, fear is that sense of being powerless. It's powerlessness. I can't. I can't do this. I can't ride the elevator because I'm afraid of heights. I went up to the top of the Sears Tower, walked out on that glass floor, and looked down 110 stories. It was a wonderful thing. It was like skydiving without a chute. And I wasn't falling. I was just standing there. And some people say, I can't do that. Yes, you can. You have the power. You've got legs. You've you got a finger to push that elevator button, take you up 110 stories. You can walk over, step out on that glass. You, you can. You're like Barack. I know that I can, but I don't want to. Fear is life dominating. It is controlling me. I am not controlling it. I feel powerless to it. The next one is very simple. Self-centeredness. You see, I'm afraid that I might, that, that, that floor might cave in and I might fall. And I, and I might die. I might die. I'm going to tell you something, folks. Listen. Nobody gets out of this world alive. Well, I might die? Well, of course you might die. You're going to die. You're going to die. You say, well, yeah, but I, I don't want to die before my time. Well, it's appointed unto man wants to die. God's already appointed it. You can't change that date. He said it. So what? what? It's all about me. Self-centeredness, self-centeredness, self-centeredness. Oh, and then it's about hysteria. Now, in contrast to that, listen, the verse says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. God has given me a spirit of power. God has also given me a spirit of love. And God has given me a spirit of a sound mind. Let me go through these quickly. On the one side is negativity. I'm powerless. I'm self-centered. I'm hysterical because I can't do that. On the other side, it's all positive. I have the power of God. I've got the love of God. I've got a sound mind of God. So how do I act positively? I clicked that twice. First of all, you've got to focus on God's power. In Philippians 4.13, write this down if it's not in your bulletin there, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I know you say I can't. God says, oh, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. What it really boils down, boils down to is not that I can't. It's just... I don't want to. I don't want to. And so we live losing out on life because we're afraid to do what we can do, but we just don't want to. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The next one is God's love. I focus on God's love. I focus on God's power. I focus on God's love. This is a powerful verse. There is no fear in love. Boom. Love is the opposite of self-centeredness. Opposite of self-centeredness. A woman is in the house. There's a fire. She grabs her children. She runs out. She realizes that one of her children that she thought was old enough to run out on her own is still in the house that's on fire. The woman has a fear, a phobia of fire. But because her child is in there that she loves, she runs right back into the thing she is afraid of to gather up her child and bring that child back out. See, perfect love cast out the fear, what she was afraid of, because she, she's no longer self-centered. She's other-focused on her child, she will self-sacrifice herself for the child out of love. And so you focus on God's love. You see, perfect love drives out fear. So I focus on love, the love of God. The last one is sound mind. The doctor calls and leaves a message on your phone recorder. I got good news and I got bad news. That's all you got. Call me back. You're calling, but office is closed. It's all weekend. You're not worried about the good news. You're worried about the bad news. So what happens? Unsound mind kicks in. 
you start thinking worst case scenario. Man, I just went in for my physical. I wonder if there's a lump. I don't know, you start feeling all over. <laughs> Maybe I got cancer. Maybe it's inoperable. You see what's happening here? Unsound mind. All you know is it got bad news. All right? Got unsound mind. And now you, before you know it, you're on the phone, you're calling Mike Evans, you need a cemetery plot, you need a funeral director. Because you got yourself in the grave, right? That's an unsound, that's a crazy, hysterical mind going crazy. Finally on Monday, you pick up the phone, you call, you dial in, and he says, yeah, I got good news. Hey, everything turned out fine, he said, but uh, the bad news is your insurance isn't going to cover the cost of the visit. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Good news, bad news, you're a doctor. You don't say things like that. <laughs> Come on. Do you know most of the things we worry about never, ever come to pass? They don't. They don't. You've got to focus on sound-mindedness. You focus just on what you know, not more nor less. Just what you know. The doc said there's good news and bad news. I don't know any more about that. I don't know any less. So he says, finally, brothers, whatever is true... Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there's anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. When I was just a child, about, I don't know, six to eight years old, my older brother uh, had me stay up late with him and watch a TV program, and it was a horror movie about uh, the original Boris Karloff Frankenstein. It scared the death out of me. <laughs> that night, I could not sleep, man. I thought every creaker sound in the house from the furnace kicking on, he was coming down the hall to get me. <laughs> you know how that is, all right? So I did a really simple thing in my mind. I said, oh, I woke up from this nightmare. I said, you know what? I'm going to go back to sleep, but I'm going to change the channel. Choo. I viewed it just like I was turning from, you know, Channel 9 TV back in the day. <laughs> Canadian station to channel seven or four to, you know, I was changing my channel and then I said, you know what? I'm just not going to think about that. That's what this verse is saying. Some of you need to change the channel about what is intimidating you. You just need to think positive thoughts. Whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, whatever is noble, whatever is, he's got it all listed there. Change the way you think. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If you think about all that stuff that makes you afraid, you'll be afraid. If you think about all the positive good stuff, the power of God, the love of God, and all this good-sounded minded stuff, you will change. You will conquer. Listen, be courageous. This is my command, he said to Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Whoa. You mean when I'm in the elevator going up? You mean when I'm in Sears Tower standing on the glass? You mean when I walk out on that glass bridge at uh, Grand Canyon and I'm looking a mile down? Uh, do you mean when I'm flying high in the sky headed to Europe? Do you mean, and it goes on, whatever is your fear, he's right there with you. It's right there in the Bible. God's promised it. God's promised it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, there are some here who today need to trade in their fear for courage. They need to just write what it is down on a piece of paper and just take it in the office and stick it in a shredder and say, I'm getting rid of that because now I'm trusting you. I don't have to be intimidated by anyone or anything because you are with me always, even to the end of the age. Give me a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. I pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen.